Well, hello, you good people, and welcome to Life on Earth, a very special episode of Life. You can see from the screen, very special episode of Life on Earth. I have a co-host again. Yes, Amy Nacer is back just this once, because this is a very special episode. We're happy to welcome Jean Maroney back onto the show. Jean, how are you doing today? I'm great. Very glad to be here. Thank you for being here with us, Jean. Oh, there we go. A little okay. technical uh, tweak there. We are, we're so glad that you're back on the show. It feels like we spoke months ago, but it's really been a year and a half. And the reason it seems so recent is because I've listened to that episode since then. Mm -hmm. It's one of the one of those episodes I get a little more out of it every time that I revisit it. So a link is in my show notes. And folks, if you haven't heard the first time we talked to Gene, you need to hear that. Gene, when we talked last time, you you told us the story about well, you and I and Amy, we, we first met in 1990. It uh, at wasn't called Ocon at the time. It was conceptual conferences at Tamament. And uh, you, were an, you were an engineer at that time? That's right. I was still an engineer. In fact, that's where I met my husband was at Tamament that same summer. So I had it was at that summer that I actually had the learning experience that caused me to leave engineering and go into psychology. So it was a big year for me. That, that's that's a heck of a shift. Uh, just in case anybody's watching and isn't not familiar with ARC UK or objectivism, Jean, your husband is a prominent objectivist and the host of HBTV, Harry Binswanger. You've done some great episodes with him recently as well. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Now, so basically, you want me to give you the thumbnail sketch just for people who don't know my yeah, story? Yeah, what's the, the sure. quick version of that progression from being an engineer working on on lasers and stars to to what you do now? Thing, right? Well, it's sort of two things. One is I was at a place in my engineering career where I was not that interested in what I was doing, but I was inspired by a particular person. His name is Bob Fugate. And he was the leader of this research project. And I wanted to be like Bob, which I realized was discovering new stuff, leading a discovery of new stuff. I just wasn't as interested in the stuff we were discovering. And at the same time, I got very serious about objectivism. And at this conference, I realized that I asked a couple of questions, which you can still hear on the advanced topics in objectivism recordings, that were not good questions. <laughs> and I thought, that's odd. You know, I mean, I was used to doing very well, you know, in, 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 you know, doing very well in every area that I worked in. Somehow I was a little clueless in philosophy and it was seemed to be the methodology. And that got me interested in what's going on. And that led me to actually have philosophical consulting from my future husband, Harry Binswanger. That's how we got to know each other. And uh, got very interested in logical thinking skills, the psychological side of it. How do you retrain an adult mind? And that's why I went back to school in psychology. And then in the end, decided academia is not the place to do that. So I've been off on my own developing a business. And that's what the thinking lab is. The thinking lab is every tool you could possibly need to retrain your psychology in any way you wanted to. Uh, whether it's thinking skills or motivational skills, or uh, I mean, that really covers that really covers the gamut, actually. And we really we deal with it all in the thinking lab. You know, I know that the thinking labs are a subscription service, and for anybody not in the know, Thinking Directions, the website has. It's funny. I tried to count them, the number of articles, the number of essays that you've posted that are public. You don't even need to be a subscriber to see the, these rich and powerful tools. And I couldn't do it. I, I it's, it's, it's several, them. Yeah, it's several you, hundred articles are up there. Yep. <laughs> and unfortunately, they're broken down into categories. So if folks look at my okay. post, you will see a link to the categories. And the most recent one, the idea of the concept of happiness. Well, we're objectivists. Yeah. Of course, we know everything there is to know about the concept of happiness. And right away, something that jumped out of me reading that essay now, you did for this for us already with the concept of central purpose. Mm -hmm. You talked about central purpose at Ocon 2021. You've talked about it uh, with Dr. Benzwanger on his show. And one of the things that jumped out at me was, said, well, central purpose, you'll need to revisit that every three to 10 years, five to 15 years. 
And how many of us in objectivism came up with the idea, you know, reading a book like The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, oh, when I figure out my central purpose, that's my whole life. Right. And you had radical and, and much more realistic ideas about, well, here's what that looks like in reality. So reading your essay on happiness, oh, happiness isn't an emotion. Well, well, it is an emotion, but it's more durable than an emotion. That was fascinating mm -hmm. to me, that idea that, that happiness is a state of consciousness. Well, it's right there in the definition, but did, did you have that insight reading Ayn Rand's definition or did, did, did it, like, like it did with me, was that a bit of a journey to get there? It was a bit of a journey. You know, it's actually, it's funny. I've now written there are 12 articles on happiness, this happiness series mm -hmm. that Robert is talking about. And the they started with, I was going to give a talk on a different topic last year at Ocon. And I decided it was too negative. And I decided, look, let me just go positive. I have things to say about happiness. Let me do it. And then when I really sat down, I said, of course, I need to make sure we're talking about the right thing. And I realized, you know, people don't really have quite the right conception of happiness too much. They just treat it as like joy and, you know, just, oh, feeling good. Whereas happiness is a big deal. Happiness is, a, is as I said, it's a durable state of, of, of not just, you know, oh, this is nice. You know, it's not, you know, put on your happy face. That's not really what happiness is. It's, it's deeper than that. You think Howard Rourke is happy. You know, there's some serious, you know, gravity in his happiness. And it's, uh, so you need to, one of the things I learned at the Objectivist Graduate Center from my husband, Harry Vinswanger, is the importance of being very clear on your concepts and being able to see what are the examples and what are the nearest neighbors. And I think regular emotions are a little different from happiness because an emotion is in response to a particular thing that happens now, and you get this feeling that has a wave to it, right? An emotion has a little time course. Emotions don't last indefinitely. They are here now and then gone. And it's actually, unless you keep refreshing the thought or refreshing the issue, like if you get into a ruminating loop, you can stay in a mood for a while, but if you don't, they pass. And so when we're talking happiness, we're not talking about that. Emotions are ephemeral. And so I thought, well, how do I explain this? Because obviously emotions are important. And I realized that um, I needed to talk about it as a durable state and I needed to make this differentiation. So it was in trying to figure out how to explain this to an audience, because let's face it, at Ocon, we have some people who, some of them have just barely read like Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. And then some of them have read every single thing that's ever come out, uh, you know, from anybody. So I needed to make sure that I had everybody on the same page. And it was in trying to figure out how to communicate it, that I got clear on this. And then the other thing, which I'm just going to pat myself a little on the back, uh, you pointed out in your note, Robert, that I, I stress it in, specifically involves joy, love, confidence, pride, gratitude. Well, I got these because it's now actually now about, I mean, it's evolved a little bit over time, but it's about five or 10 years. I've really settled on the eight basic families of emotions. And so I got those five, that's five of the eight, those come from five of the eight basic families of emotions. So I had a short list that I could use and say, yeah, these ones are the ones that you wanna have a lot of repeatedly, and that's what makes you happy. And happiness can be, you can have a quiet level of happiness, you can have a more intense level of happiness, but it's all in that kind of emotion on a regular basis. And then again, the realism point that you brought about central purpose. Nobody is in that state of happy, you know, that state of joy all the time. I think the real issue is, are you in it most of the time? And I, mean, I say in the lecture, 80 to 90%. And that's just my observation. That's my, uh, that's a heuristic, shall we say. You know, the, uh, you also mentioned in that same essay, the concept of happiness, or excuse me, the fuller concept of happiness, uh, the negative emotions that follow from a pervasive sense of suffering or unhappiness. And it brought me to Leonard Peikoff in, in, Opar, speaking of advanced topics and objectivism, when he was first mm -hmm. writing Opar and we got to attend those, those lectures when he was still working uh, the final draft out, that uh, we talk about the benevolent universe premise. 
that gives you that pervasive sense of happiness and you know, suffering only goes down to a certain point. And he talks about the malevolent universe and people who experience happiness that only goes up to a certain point. But that yeah. sense of durability really drove it home for me, that, that happiness is a state of consciousness, not just an emotion in the same way the other emotions are. So if folks haven't read that essay yet that we've linked to, the fuller concept of happiness, there are, again, that list of, of the emotions, but also of negative emotions. Right, and, yes. And the, 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 the payoff there for doing things right is that that durability, that pervasive sense, sense of life, but open to change to some degree by the kind of techniques that you share with us. Real quick, I've got to say in the chat, we've got a lot of conversation going on. I appreciate that. Now, because we're on the Ayn Rand Center UK, I'm going to remind you that if you want your questions, your comments to stand out, you can make that happen. And don't your comments and questions deserve to stand out? Yes, they do. Put a couple dollars on it. Hit that super chat. Any money that comes in doesn't go to me, doesn't go to Amy, doesn't go to G. We're all objectivists. So we're independently wealthy, but the Ayn Rand Center UK <laughs> does need those dollars. So by all means, support the ARC UK. And if you're not already a member, there's a membership link right at the top of the chat. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to ask you about uh, a certain example that you brought up a few years ago at, o at when you were lecturing at Ocon about happiness. And, um, you know, you were taught, you, we, we just spoke about how uh, happiness or that kind of state, a uh, successful state of life feeling um, should be with you 80% of your waking hours. Um, and you had mentioned a really good example, I thought, um, where you worked on your own emotional response to, so after you got into an argument, you realized that pretty consistently, it took you about 30 minutes to actually kind of calm your physiological state, your, your mental state, get some clarity. So it took some time to actually uh, get some clarity and calm yourself down emotionally and, and physically. And, um, and so I'd like to talk, I'd like to ask you more about that. That's I thought that was a very good example in terms of like, you know, this this that was your goal to try to lessen that amount of time. Right. Right. Well, this and understanding again the difference between emotions and happiness helped with that because emotions are they do have a short time course and if you stay in that bad state, you must be or or in that state, you must be rehearsing something and that's what I realized is that I was in a, a thinking loop where I was focusing on the argument and what I thought was wrong. And of course that would then, every time I thought that I would have more anger or whatever it was, and that would trigger additional thoughts related to the, the wrong things. I call this a threat orientation. Basically the whole focus is on the threat. And when you really start focusing on threats, you can get pretty negative pretty fast because there are threats to be seen there. The, the thing that I try, that I teach and that I, that once I realized what was going on that I was able to then implement, I've got it down to like five minutes now, is what you need to awesome. do is you need to, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, talk about a change in your quality of life. If you can change every time you get upset, you're upset for five minutes instead of half an hour, that's a lot of time that you've reclaimed, right? And a lot of relationship uh, benefit too. The thing you need to do is you need to realize what's happening and then deliberately switch from a threat orientation to a value orientation. And this is something you can absolutely do consciously because what is a threat? A threat is a threat to a value. If you just look at those threats in, in, instead of stopping there and having your emotions there, the threat-based emotions are important. The threat-based the threat emotions alert you to threats that you need to know about, but you need to know about them not so much because of the threats, because of the value that is threatened, but it takes another step. The emotion doesn't point you at the value, it points you at the threat. You need to pause and say, well, why is that a threat to me? What is it a threat to? And when you turn your attention over to what the value is that you're really wanting here, that you're worried about, you, you look, suddenly you're looking at the world from a different perspective. It really is that shift in perspective that you get from glass half full, glass half empty. And it's not, it's not Mickey Mouse. It's you're now seeing the world as there are a lot of values around here. And yes, there's a threat there and there's a threat there, but I want that value. So what's the best way to that value given these threats as opposed to, oh, threat here, threat here, what am I gonna do? 
totally different sense of whether you're in control or not. Mm-hmm. And of course, when you're in when you're in an argument with someone you care about, almost certainly the values you're after are things that in fact are probably joint values. And as soon as you realize that, you are then in a position where you can then go back to the conversation and say, hey, you know, what I'm really worried about is these values. Can we talk about these? Surprise, surprise. You can now have a constructive conversation. Complete change of experience. You know, in that regard, you've talked about clarity, clarity of definitions, know what you're saying, what you mean when you say it. And this idea of measuring your happiness struck me initially as, you know, Amy mentioned the 80% measure. It's, it feels artificial or it feels arbitrary. And then I remembered, well, first of all, I was stuck on the idea that we measure emotions. We measure love ordinally, not cardinally. In other words, first, right. second, third, not one, two, three. But you take it a step further than that. And, and you even brought in you know Peter Drucker's idea that, well, what gets measured gets managed. I thought, yeah, right. I can't think of a better <laughs> case for writing things down and actually analyzing it than that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and you've got a whole essay on you know thought downloads. Well, let me tell you something about the the measure because one of the articles yes. in the Hapsky series is on this, and I think it's helpful to realize metrics are helpful. One of the distinctions I make in the thinking lab is I distinguish goals from metrics. I think sometimes people put metrics on things, and then they say, "Oh, well, that's I have to meet that number." I don't think that's actually so helpful. The reason you make metrics is to help you monitor. And so since I wrote that article, and we must have a half a dozen people in the thinking lab who are doing, I have it, particularly in my launch program, I have them uh, use what I call an emotional resilience tool where you track your emotional resilience each day. And about a half a dozen people after that article said, I want to track my happiness, my happiness level. And, you know, people find out interesting things from doing this. It's like when you actually stop and say, okay, what was my happiness level yesterday? I, I had one person tell one person tell me, you know, I'm not going to drink anymore. Apparently, he had drunk a little bit too much, and he saw he had a terrible day when he didn't drink, and it had not occurred to him before. Okay, that's helpful information, right? I mean, it's it it it's not that he didn't know. It's that by raising his level of awareness to actually see where what does in fact affect his happiness he was able to pinpoint that as opposed to have it when you just have to say well you just have your experience and you reflect on your experience well what's causing you know what is the biggest thing that i could change to make me happier it's not so obvious but if you're tracking then you actually can zero in on what the issues are i had another person who was surprised to see um again it was like people issues that were causing whenever her numbers went down it was people issues that's helpful. That means that maybe what you want are some more people skills, because that's the thing that is is bringing you down. Uh, so, it's not that um, the reason to measure anything, the reason to track anything, is because you want a little more self aware with respect to self improvement. It's because you want a little more awareness of it, so that you can figure out where how can I make my life better. That's the reason to monitor it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, before we uh, thank Apollo Zeus for his super chat and get to his uh, comment, I just wanted to uh, kind of kind of reiterate uh, what exactly do you do, Gene Maroney, uh, at ThinkingDirections.com. Um, you, it sounds like you have a whole bunch of articles on this, a lot of free content on your website. You even have like a, a systematic. Uh, from soup to nuts, top to bottom, um, series of articles, 12 of them on happiness we're talking about today. And uh, you also meet with people on Zoom online and you you discuss and give them activities and, and kind of workshop with them and sure. help them to uh, get them to achieve their goals and to introspect better. Is that, uh, is it, am I in the sure. right direction there? <laughs> you want me to give you just a quick rundown of the various offerings that I have? Yes. Right, sure. So um, so the main offering, the thing that I do the most of is the Thinking Lab, right? Which has a tremendous amount of online content. Basically every course that I've given over the last 15 years has shown up now, actually it's over the last 20 years, is on the Thinking Lab. They, they we're now in the process, instead of adding new content, we're upgrading the content. So like 
uh, my next class, the first class in June is gonna be the first in a series on all about emotions. There's stuff from emotions from the past, but we're gonna redo it all in an integrated way uh, based on my current understanding. We just did that with rational goal setting. And in the fall, we did it with uh, self-direction, which is the alternative to self-discipline and uh, self-indulgence. So, so there are these major self-study courses and we're always running one of those. So there are two new classes every month and there's always some kind of Q and A each month. There's either a short Q and A or there's what I call a thinking day, which is a day when between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern, I'm on the Zoom at least four hours to coach and answer questions, give advice so that people can set that aside as, a, as an in-depth day for doing some big project and get some help on it. Uh, so do, that's, they make a, do they make appointments for that or is it more of a drop-in session? It's a drop-in session. So I'm on, the, I'm on the Zoom from 10 to 12 and then two to three and then five to six. And then everyone shows up at quarter of six and we do a, a, a closing circle with celebrations, which is really oh. fun. Nice. And uh, yeah, it's terrific actually. And uh, so, so it helps people in different time zones because it's, you know, it's kind of early. 10 a.m. is pretty early for the West Coast. And, um, but, you know, people can come in at some time and get help. Uh, so that's my main offering. And then in the last couple of years, I've also been offering a group coaching add-on to that, which is called Launch, which is an eight-week program, achieve a major goal in eight weeks. It starts on a thinking day and ends on a thinking day. And I coach them to set, they, they come in with a really big goal. It can be a very big goal. And we figure out how to make really significant progress during the eight weeks and coach them on doing that. And, you know, that includes daily thought work and includes, um, I recommend that they take one of the online classes. It's, it's a lot of work. It's very exciting. People do amazing things in the launches. It's actually been really, it's wildly inspiring just to attend the coaching calls because people are really making big shifts in their lives with this. So that's exciting. Those are the two programs that are really just, you know, to the public, to adults available pretty much throughout the year. I then also have corporate work. So I'm actually restarting some of my corporate work. I'm in August. It looks like I'm going to do thinking tactics for getting unstuck. So I've used to do a lot of corporate work. I haven't done as much recently. I think this is going to be the new program for that. I think it's going to be terrific. So that's an all day program. Corporation hires me to do that. I probably will do a public workshop on that at some point. Um, I've done in the past public workshops on do what matters most and the old thinking tactics workshop. So, you know, that's something that I do from time to time. I've also done the um, rationally connected conversations, which is my version of nonviolent communication. I do a four day intensive. I did one of those last month. And I'm going to do another one in November. That's a smaller group, very intense, but, you know, really exciting. And then um, I, I, that actually really covers it. So I do corporate programs, public programs, online programs. That's, and then, you know, I speak occasionally, like at the, at the Ayn Rand conferences, I, I'll be speaking again at Ocon this summer. So. Fantastic. Well, we're going to see you in Miami. <laughs> yes. Great. We're just going to drive over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, but so, and, and uh, what about um, work on a book perhaps? Well, this is this series, the happiness series, there are three series that I think are at the right level for a book, and I'm going to put, turn them into a book. So it's the Happiness Series, the Central Purpose Series, and the um, Value Series that are on the blog. And that they're basically at the right level. I'm going to do some editing this summer, and then I'm going to release it as a book. So that will be out soon. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, this idea of getting unstuck that you're going, that you're going to lecture on you've already got so many resources on your website for that if people want just a taste of it even before you do decide to join thinking labs um there's the, you, you know this you've got a whole category called course correction yes uh -huh. <laughs> including essays on how to get unstuck how to overcome yep. obstacles outstanding yep. and again folks these the, these articles these essays they're on the website. They're freely available. You need to get in there and read them. And Jean, I should probably save this for the, I'll mention it again at the end, but if folks click on freebies, they can also receive the three MP3s to get you started on this material and, That's right. uh, and the PDF to go with that as well. So right. well, the thinking direction starter kit, right? Yep. Yeah. Starter kit. What, what more <laughs> could you want? Outstanding. Um, in your article, what you need to know about suffering 
to be mm-hmm. happy. Mm-hmm. You know, in regard to saying no to overload, you say it is always possible to reduce the load. Can, can you share a tip or two for reducing overload? Right. Well, there are really two ways to do it. One is offload to paper. So offload when you have paper. too much stuff going through your head, start putting it down on paper. Make a list. Do thinking on paper. You know, some people like mind maps for that. Get it out of your head and onto paper. That will reduce the load because part of the load is you've got so many great ideas that they they come up faster than you can pay attention to them. Well, if you put them on paper, you eventually get all those ideas that have come up out onto paper and then you can look at them, but you can't hold them all in your head at one time. So that's one very simple thing. The other thing is now sometimes, I mean, putting on paper always makes a difference. Sometimes when you put it on paper, you then feel overloaded when you look at what's on the paper. Right. So like, right. Like if you make a to-do list and it has 200 items on it, that is not, you're still going to be overloaded. You're going to feel a lot better than you did before you put it on paper, but you're still going to be overloaded. And there you need to do, there's really three <laughs> list group choose. You've done the list. You need to group it. That's what, you know, concepts are devices to achieve unit economy. The reason we categorize, the reason we put things under a category is to reduce the units. You need to reduce the units. You can't hold that all in mind. So you group it and then choose. Ultimately, the way you reduce the crow is you say, I'm only going to think about that because that's the important thing. Prioritizing is your number one way to reduce overload. Prioritize. I, obviously, I love the idea of writing things down. And, and I'm, an, I'm a zealot for externalizing. I really think putting your thoughts on paper for all the other things it does also makes your thoughts more objective. You see them in the real world. You're connected now to something out there. But all it's, the also way a, people- it's also a discipline, Robert, because the thought as it, when the thought comes up, I actually think it's the articulating the thought in a full sentence that really gives it a full identity. When you have it and it's just, it's not yet articulated, it is, it's, it's, almost, a, it's almost better thought of as a proto thought. I don't, I don't know quite the right way to think about it, but the integration has not been fully made until you put it into the package of the sentence. And you can do that internally. It takes a lot of discipline, but it's easy to do it if you just have your, you know, say a sentence with words to another person or write a sentence on paper. It gives you the discipline of making the thought into a complete thought. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I I think of, we talk about honesty. Well, of course, as objectivists, we would never be dishonest. But that excuse people make, well, it's only in my head, as if what's in your head is less important than what's out there. But even those of us who would never tell a lie still fall prey to, well, I'm only thinking about it. I'm not putting it out there. I'm not committed, in other words. But I put it down on paper. That really gives it something. Mm-hmm. And, and thinking on paper and, and just externalizing to me has, has enormous power. So I especially appreciate that. And, and again, you, you do talk about um, you know, thought downloads, which yep. a lot of people would think of as journaling or folks who are familiar with Julia Cameron would talk about morning mm-hmm. pages. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with Julia Cameron, the artist's way? Yeah, so I have the book and I read part of it. I I I I, I was I wasn't able to wade through the whole book, but I know oh, she's got two ideas, right? The artist date and the morning pages, two great ideas yeah, that she has. Yes. No, those and you know, best, yeah. Yeah. Those I got, those I agree with. And just for people who don't know, the artist date is once a week, plan a three hour thing that you do that is just to fill up your emotional reservoirs, fill up your that's what you need for artistic creativity. And whether it's you go to the zoo or you go to the museum or you paint or whatever it is, or you sit in nature, three hours, once a week, artist date. Great idea. The idea of morning. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Morning pages is every morning, fill up three pages in your journal, no matter what, three pages a day. And of course, she's journaling. I think people sometimes do what I would call free writing, which is different from thinking on paper and that you just... Yeah. Whatever is coming through your head, you just write it down. And there's benefits to that. There's yeah. definitely benefit to that. The difference between that and thinking on paper is with thinking on paper, there's actually something you want to figure out, 
So you have a goal and you're a little more purposeful. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, morning pages definitely don't replace thinking on paper. No, no, no. Morning pages, I, I've, uh, I've actually found them very helpful for myself to mm -hmm. try to get the um, implicit thoughts that are not quite yeah. at the surface of my mind, but are nagging me. And then I get yeah. to write them down. I get to see, okay, this is what I'm actually dealing with. And this is why I may not be as happy as I, as I am. There's mm -hmm. something distracting me. And now I have figured out what it is. Right. Yes. And this gets to something that Robert was saying. I, I think it's what's great about this idea of morning pages or free writing is you give yourself permission to write down whatever is going on in your mind. Yep. And you shouldn't say, oh, I don't think that's honest or look what I'm trying to get away with. No, this is it's it's there is no unthinkable thought. You never mm -hmm. criticize yourself for having a thought. You actually a thought comes up from your subconscious data banks. It's your values and your knowledge that caused that thought. Now, if it turns out that the thought that came up is actually wrong and you think is leading you in a wrong direction, that's actually helpful information. It means that something's maybe a little bit miswired. Good to know. And good, you, this is something you want to keep an eye out for because if that comes up, you want to make sure you do a conscious course correction on it. But that's mm -hmm. good to know and that can get rewired. So it's very important to be completely benevolent about whatever comes up from your subconscious. And I think the idea of fill up three pages a day helps with that, helps people just be completely yeah. willing, write down whatever it is. Uh, folks need to know that that is a theme that runs throughout your writing is the value orientation. Mm -hmm. And you have whole uh, uh, categories on value orientation that you, you're focused on what you're working to achieve. You wonder what's the difference between an artist's date and just you know, doing something you feel like doing. And you, the artist, it makes me think of date night, you know, in a marriage, yeah. you have date nights. It's, and of course, you're going to go out together. You're going to do things. To, yeah, but you set aside time for the best of what we do together. Right. And artist's date is addressing, well, that this is for the best of what I want to do creatively, but also productively, as long as it is creative and it's not just the grunge part of a job. So I, I especially like that. If I could, I'd like to, and, and this will be a little off topic, but we do have a super chat from Apollo Zeus. We do thank you for that. And he asks this, the correlation of OCD to self-esteem and the malevolent universe premise. I'm, that, that, that's kind of broad, but what do you think? Is there anything that you would have to say about the correlation of OCD to self-esteem and the malevolent universe premise? Well, I, uh, I, I, so I'm not a clinical therapist. I'm not a clinical psychologist, right? My, my degree in psychology was in experimental psychology, not in clinical psychology. So like OCD, I have a layman's understanding of OCD, right? I'm not a therapist. So, but I think a lot about, uh, I think a lot about self-esteem. I have a slightly different view of self-esteem than I think most objectivists do. And what was the third one? The Melvin universe. So premise. So I have a different take on all three of these things than other people do. You, you, I, I'm so tempted I'm not to sure ask about to them, but this could probably go on for a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, the self-esteem one seems most intriguing to me. In, in what way do okay. you think your, your view of self-esteem differs mm -hmm. from most objectivists? Well, this also has to do with the idea of a malevolent universe premise. I think it's actually kind of problematic to say, to, to think of, oh, well, I have self-esteem or I don't have self-esteem or I have low self-esteem. I think it, the, the way that it's sometimes described by non-objectivists is it's labeling. And there is a problem with that. When you just, when you basically like characterize yourself in that way, it dis distracts you from the real issue. The real issue is everybody feels self-doubt from time to time. They, everybody gets in a place where they suddenly, you know, are not sure that they can, maybe not, maybe, maybe not the issue of worthiness, but certainly the issue of efficacy comes up and they, they feel a little wobbly that, you know, what differs between people is how often that happens, not whether it happens and what you need to be able to do. And what people who quote unquote have self-esteem can do is that they can activate a self-esteem context in that situation. 
And one of the classes I gave, this is this is one of the new things that I've been doing the last couple of years. I, this, my view on self-esteem has really settled in about the last two years. I have a class I gave called New Thoughts and Self-Esteem that's part of the launch bonus stuff. I have this little saying that I read that I think everybody in the thinking lab and probably everybody listening to this podcast could agree with. And it's it goes something like this. I right now am you know, intending to live my life well. I am intending to do the right thing. I am wanting to make my life happy. I have some issues, but I'm willing to do the work to change, you know, to, to deal with these issues. And it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's like a, 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 a this assertion of, I have good things. I've done good things. I have good stuff. Yes, I may have made some mistakes, but I'm going to face them. I'm going to look at them. It's a statement of honesty and integrity. And, and it's a statement of intention. And that is, you need to be able to say that about yourself. And if you can't say that about yourself, you need to go in and look and maybe deal with some stuff that you haven't dealt with. But if you can say that about yourself, then when you experience doubt, that's the context you want to bring to bear. It's, yeah, okay, there may be some problem here, but I'm a good person. I'm going to figure out how to deal with this. I'm not going to, and, and, and I have a shorthand version of this about how to hold the context, which is, um, I'll tell you the shorthand version and the more technical version or the more serious version. I think of it as having your own back, which means don't run away, don't melt down, don't stab yourself in the back, right? If you think have your own back, that's, that's, that comes from fighting, right? If, you, if you're attacked on the street, you want your ally to have your back. So you're fighting back to back so no one can come up and, and hurt you. And what do you want that ally to do? You don't want them to run away. You don't want them to melt down. You don't want them to stab you in the back. <laughs> and that's what you want to do for yourself when you're in a difficult situation, when you're suddenly, oh no, what am uh, But you know, yeah. in trouble, you want to not run away, not melt down, not stab yourself in the back. Well, what does not run away mean? It means that you're not going to fake reality. You're not. You're going to face the facts. This is a real difficult situation. I'm not going to run away from the situation. I'm going to deal with it, which means I'm going to feel the feelings. So you don't run away from the feelings either, right? You're actually going to deal with reality. That's what don't run away is. What is don't melt down? I'm going to fight for my values here. You know, what happens when you're going to strengthen your spine and say, look, I have values. This is a difficult situation. I want to get, I'm selfish. I'm going to get what's good for me in this situation. That's going to take some strength and some courage. Okay, I'm in. I'm going to deal with this situation. I'm going to deal with it in a way that's selfish. And then don't stab your, myself in the back. Well, if you know that you tend to be a little secondhand and just, you know, go for approval, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to be on the alert. I'm not going to just go for approval. Or if you know that you tend to, you know, like lose your temper and, you know, just shoot off your mouth, you say, okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take some step. I know what to do to calm down, whatever. I'm going to do that instead. You're not going to stab yourself in the back. Well, I can't tell and, you how, how heartening I find that to hear somebody say that intentions matter, that good intent matters, because I bring this up and a lot of folks will say, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. People use their intentions and as an excuse not to follow through, but to actually be earnest and honest in your approach to actually have the the actual intention matters. Intent matters. People of good intent matter. Yes. And I think part of the reason there's confusion about this is the difference between you judging yourself and you judging an, another person or another person judging you. So you can actually decide, I'm changing this. I am not going to be like, say, secondhand. I am going to deal with this secondhand problem. And you can make that intention. And you know that about yourself because you can read your own mind. You can't read someone else's mind, but you can read yours. And then, you know, it may be very difficult. It, it will be, actually, because you've got all this automatized stuff in yours. Oh, my God, there I'm secondhand there. God, I'm secondhanded there, too. Right. But there's a big difference between you're looking and saying, oh, Huh, so what do I do about that? As a, because I'm changing this, then, oh, well, that's just me. I'm right. secondhand. Right. Right. Or, that, or, that's, or making excuses for yourself and that that's my lot in life or that's how I was raised or however right. I, oh, well, I, I can change about yeah. myself. 
Right. I guess, right. I guess I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm too second handed. Right. I mean, that's talk about melting down yeah. instead of, instead of having the courage and not stabbing yourself in the back. So yeah. when people, just, yeah. I, was so this, say, I remember Amy once told me, I can read my own mind. And it was kind of humorous <laughs> at the time, but taking yeah. that literally yeah. it's yeah you can you actually you know it's it, it's a really nice a really wonderful feeling to know that you're on that that for me i have a pretty easy time of being honest with myself of right of you know like doing that kind of uh, morning pages work writing things down um continuously not having the pen leave the paper keeping going and, and just um putting out whatever it is in my mind within there are no bad thoughts um just so that i can see exactly where i'm at and to introspect in that way and to be kind to myself because honesty is kindness to yourself um, my understanding of that so yeah well as not, that, says, that sounds you need like to be an ally to yes, yourself you need to be an ally and a friend to yourself absolutely yes absolutely. and fight for yourself the way you would fight for somebody the way you would for your kids the yes. way you would for your parents right so let me just tie what i just said to the other two things that um came up oh if i could uh, real, i'm sorry real quick before uh before it scrolls off my page i've got to give a quick shout out to nick Nick Bruno is in with a super chat and says, well, thank you for that, Nick. Very much appreciated. Jeff Bannister, regular supporter of the ARC UK, is also on board with the super chat, and we very much appreciate that. And finally, oh, two more. Free trade is in, and thank you. Uh, and Mary Aline as well with a very generous super chat. Um, no questions, just support for you, for us, for the ARC UK. So thank you. Sorry, Jean, go ahead. No, that's great. Thank you to you guys, too. So so like in relate to the malevolent universe premise. So again, yes. I'm a little hesitant about like labeling, say, oh, I have the malevolent universe premise. We all get in a threat orientation at times. The question is, is that your dominant state? And I think the important thing is if you are in a threat orientation, it takes a conscious act to get back into a value orientation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you don't just stay there, you know, bad things happen. And if you let them, they will suck you into a threat orientation. So I don't think it's so much a premise as it is an alert. Hey, I need to actually, this is not, this is not the logical way to look at the world. It is not logical to look at the world as all threats. It's much more logical to look at it as a world of values that has some threats in the, and that I, I just need to know about those so that I can get around them because I want to get my values and I'm going to do it in the way that it, but if it requires dealing directly with the threat, okay, I'll do that. But if I can avoid the threat, let's avoid the threat. But I'm focused on my values, not threats. And then uh, OCD is a little bit different. So compulsion, you know, that's a classic, like really clinical issue. But I do think I understand something about compulsion that my, my perspective on this is a little different from people's. I think what compulsion, well, actually, maybe it's not. Let me not be self-aggrandizing here. Here's how I understand compulsion. It's not just a desire, right? It's a desire that has an extra push and or an extra push to it. And the reason it has an extra push is because there's something awful that you don't want to see, what I would call an anti-value. You think is terrible. It would be awful if you went there. It would be the end of the world. And so you've been avoiding it very carefully. And the way you've avoided it is by going over here, like say to cigarettes or to sugar or something. And every time you get close to this really bad thing, you run away from it and you run toward, let's just say cigarettes. What happens then is there already was a little desire for say cigarettes, or maybe it's a good thing. You can have a compulsion, like washing your hands. Washing your hands is a perfectly good thing perfectly rational, right? We all wash our hands. You take a good thing you already had, it was somewhat of a value, but now it's gotten distorted because to avoid this bad thing, you keep going in the same direction. And the way you strengthen a value is by repeatedly, intentionally gain, acting to gain and keep it. And so now washing your hands or cigarettes is now wildly disproportionately strong value. And that's what the problem is. Now, how do you deal with that? You got to find that scary thing and start actually seeing it's not as bad as you think, because there's 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 a, a line from a class I took a long time ago, and I actually don't know the name of the person who gave this class, but he said, he was talking about how people said, I can't stand it. And he said, you can stand anything but death, which is true. <laughs> when you say, I can't stand it, 
You just mean that would be really awful, but you need to actually challenge that. This is a great example where taking things absolutely literally. Yes, yeah. you can stand it. You don't particularly want to stand it, but you need to <laughs> see, yes, I could handle that if I really needed to. I could yeah. handle that. And that is part of facing facts, not running away. Oh, that's so excellent. That's great. Um, folks, should when you go to Thinking Directions, one of the essays to look for is called You Always have a choice. It immediately brought to mind the story Ayn Rand tells about uh, she knew she knew a woman uh, in her apartment building it was being told, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. And her response was, Mr. They ain't nothing I've got to do but die, <laughs> you know, someday. And, uh, and I love that. You always, all, you might not like your choices, but you right. always have a choice. Yes. Very much appreciate that. We got another super chat in. Equal to Reality wants to join the super chat crew. Thank you for that. He is in for two euros as well. And uh, thank you for all the super chats today. By all means, keep them coming. We are not done yet. But yes, I especially appreciate that that essay. You always have a choice. I know one objection is, well, sure, I have choices, but I don't I don't like any of my choices. Do you run into that kind of roadblock or objection? And how how would you help somebody through that? Right. So this is a great example where objectivism really helps because the first thing is you need to look you need to look at the facts and is it really true that these are your choices like let's let's get a real situation it's always easier to deal with the real situation what would be an example where people don't like any of their choices that you the kind of thing you like to bring up oh well the, well, the obvious one i hear is i i don't like my job uh, but I also don't want to get fired. So I've got to go to work in the morning. I've got to drag yeah, myself yeah. out of bed. Okay, right. Um, so, and of course, part of the way that this has plausibility, so it's not, so they say, I don't have a choice. This already puts on some blinders and and then, and they just look at, well, I have to go to my job. So you're you're literally not considering any other things, right? Right there. As soon as you start putting blinders on, you are reducing your operational intelligence. Don't do that. Don't do that. What I recommend in this situation, obviously you've got some, a bunch of feelings about this and some conflict over going work to work. Whenever you have some internal conflict, I recommend giving contrary motivation a fair hearing. Okay, so why do you not wanna to go to work? So let's say it's boring or you don't like uh, you're worried about the bosses being mean to you or something. I don't know, let's say. And then, well, why are you even considering going to work? Well, you like the paycheck, okay. And you don't see any other way to make that money right now. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to actually look at this. So what are you looking for? Let's, let's, that's three values here, intellectual stimulation, a good connection with the people around you and a uh, monetary reward, you know, actual uh, wealth, basically, right? If you look at this and say, which is actually more important to me right now, right? Which is more important to me? And first of all, if you put it in those terms, you can probably find a way to make the work be a little more intellectually stimulating. You can also, if you actually go in with the idea, if you want to have a better connection with my boss, you can probably find ways to have a better connection with your boss, right? <clears throat> and, and then if, and it, but if you, if that's really what you want, so, so it, just by looking at it in terms of a value orientation, you can remove a lot of the negativity and you can find a way to do the thing that yes, logically is the right thing to do in a much more pleasant manner. Now, is it going to be the happiest, you know, the most joyful thing you do? Well, it doesn't sound like it. Sounds like this is not the right job for you. But you're not going to ever figure out what the right job is or get the right job if you only look at it in those negative tunnel vision terms. You need, like, I mean, I was just, you know, these issues like this do come up in launch. And I'm thinking of one person who uh, is having problems with a job and has actually realized what what he wants to do is figure out how to turn this job into a part-time job. And his project right now is actually figuring out everything he thinks he needs to do to make the case to make his job into a part-time job so he could basically retire, partially retire. And that this would be the best of all worlds. And that's what he's, he's fighting for that value right now. 
as opposed to lamenting over he doesn't have this, doesn't like this job and doesn't think he can get a different one, right? So you can only figure out these creative solutions if you look at them with a value orientation. So I'm not saying that you're going to like all your choices, but accepting reality, this is, these are, this is where I am right now. And these are my values. That is part of the solution, the way forward, no matter how difficult the situation is that you're in. And, and all of the other resources you provide really feed into this. If, yeah. if, if folks can clarify their values so that then they can figure out, well, yes. okay, th this job doesn't serve me. This job doesn't right. suit my values. It doesn't align with my values. Now I can set a goal that aligns with my values. And now that I have a goal, I can put together a plan. And you do all this on paper. I know I'm the kind of guy myself. I tend to carry it all around in my head. Mm -hmm. And I have to remind myself, write these things down. Make them real. Make them out there. Make them objective. Well, and I think people do operate, you know, not everybody operates with as much paper as I do. I'm very much a paper girl. <laughs> but I... Uh, I think the real thing to think about the paper is if what you're doing is working and is going well and everything is flowing, wonderful. You don't need to change that. You don't need to add paper into the equation. But if there's an area that needs more attention, paper is going to let you help, help you raise the monitoring level of that area. It's going to help you to untangle, you know, be less confused about it, track it more carefully. Uh, think it through more more deeply that's what the pa the paper is just a source of leverage to be able to deal with the areas where you want to actually change the status quo and the, and those thought downloads even if everything's going well you yeah. pointed out that you can't shortchange the celebration aspect you've got it you've got to give yourself what you deserve for achieving these things yeah that's a big part of quality of life is if, you know taking the time to actually Notice what you have achieved, what you, you know, they, there are all kinds of frou frou ways that people say this, you know, stop and smell the roses, you know, whatever. Oh, look at all. I'm, but I'm guilty. you actually, right. <laughs> but it's important that this is, this is how you maintain a benevolent universe perspective is that you actually hold in mind the values around you. You are living in a world of values. We're here in the 21st century. Look at the standard of living that we have. Look at the kinds of houses we can live in. I mean, look at the, the you know, you have art, you know, behind you, right? I mean, it, it's amazing where we're living. And if you don't actually give it a little attention, it just fades into the background. Yes. Just so another super chat from Apollo Zeus says, love Jean Maroney, of course. And we do too. Jean, extraordinary ideas, extraordinary resources and and I love that you're willing to say, you know, my take on things is a little different than the average objectivist. Yeah. It, it not only are you providing outstanding thoughts, but I don't know, I think that that little shock to the senses there is good for all of us. <laughs> wrong. It's, are you well, think, are you thinking about this stuff firsthand? You know, it's and it's not so much. I mean, I and I have to say, going through those uh, twelve articles of yours on happiness on your website, thinkingdirections.com, I was. There was actually one about uh, serenity as a stepping stone to happiness, and I really was just blown away by that. And 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 specifically about just little things that you did to kind of distinguish between um, what you called like contemplative contemplative emotions and action impulses. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about that, and because um, I I'm for me I find myself really in the realm of action impulses um mm -hmm. gotta get it done gotta get it done <laughs> and not enough time in actually contemplating my values feeling serene contentment um just, just feeling love or, or feeling relief or sadness okay well so and and yeah, so, so let me just explain what I mean by serenity and why I called it a stepping stone to happiness. I'll just do that quickly and then see if I can touch into what you're asking about, Amy. So one of the points I make in those articles is that, well, what do you do if you're suffering, right? Well, I think what you do is, is the way that you get back to a more neutral state is by really accepting the facts, by really accepting reality. 
if you're suffering, there is something bad, assuming there's something bad going on, really embracing, yeah, this is a difficult situation makes the difference. The thing that causes suffering is internal conflict, fighting with yourself. That is what really creates the suffering. And um, the, so, and what happens then when you do that is that emotions like guilt, like suppose you're feeling guilty about how you handled something. If you say, yeah, you know what? That I, I made a mistake there and I need to do something about that, which would be accepting, you know, really accepting I did the wrong thing. I need to do something about that. Your emotional, your emotions shift when that happens. The guilt is an alert saying, you need to pay attention to this. When you actually pay attention to it, it's like, Oh, yeah. And what you're going to feel then is sad because what you, you did not live up to your own expectations. You're going to feel sadness at that point. Now, that is a different quality of emotion from guilt. It doesn't have that tension and, th and it's not threat oriented. Once you have turned to, wow, it's really important to me. Like, for example, let's say you bit the head off someone. Well, I mean, I don't mean literally. I mean, you yelled at someone that you should have been, you should have, and, and it's your fault that something spiraled out of control and you realize, oh my God, I screwed up, right? The reason you feel sad is you realize, wow, you know, I really, I didn't live up to my standards. I didn't do what, what matters to me. What matters to me is actually being, you know, dignified and, and polite and sociable or whatever it is. So I'm just making something up, right? You have now shifted from, oh, I'm a bad person or something bad happened there. This is terrible. Or, I feel bad about this to your values. You actually are thinking about your values of dignity and, you know, connection and whatever it is. Now you're thinking about them in terms of loss, but that has a totally, that, those are value oriented emotions and they have a completely different experience associated with them. And they are, as I said, contemplative emotions, they're calm. That's what calms down those th big threat oriented emotions that you get when you're suffering. And that's what, I mean, if you think about um, when people have to deal with some really big issue, there are various stages of grief and they get from fighting reality to basically accepting it. When they get to accepting it, they're still very sad, but they're in a much better place. They're a much more stable place. You can think in that place, mm -hmm. right? You can't think when you're fighting yourself, when you're in an internal conflict like that. So, and I, and I just pointed out that there's, there are a number of, some emotions are more action oriented and some are more contemplative. Love and, and grief are both very contemplative. Um, some of the more mild versions of joy, like satisfaction is more contemplative. Um, the uh, relief, is now relief is the feeling you get, it's still threat oriented, but it's the feeling you get when a threat has been removed. And that is, again, there's no action needed, right? The contemplative emotions are the ones that don't have any action required. Whereas in contrast, the ones that have a lot of action, a, a lot of impulse that are, you know, really excitability, they're pulling you in different directions. And that can create its own problem, right? If you're being like, you can have the problem of being too excited. It's not just um, threat-oriented emotions that can put you into an emotional state that's a problem. If you're overexcited, you can get hyper and like you're bouncing around off the walls and you can't concentrate and you're, you know, it's not actually such an enjoyable state. I mean, it's, it's got, it's high and it's like everything you're feeling is positive, but you're like out of control. And it's actually a little distressing because you can't, you just, you like can't hold a purpose in mind. So you're a little dysfunctional actually in that state. And if, if you have too much of that, like that's when you're overloaded sometimes, that's really what it is, is I need to do this and this and this and this. And individually, they'd all be great, but taken together, they're actually too much for your mind. They're actually a little dysfunctional. But there, that's an issue of, uh, th that would be another dysfunctional state that's not as unpleasant as some of the other ones, but it's actually not a, not a great state and also needs, um, it's contrary motivation again, even though it's all positive, it's pulling you in different directions. And again, you need to give it a fair hearing and figure out, well, what matters? And when you give it that fair hearing, the same thing is going to happen, right? 
an emotion is an alert to a value. It's either directly an alert if it's a value oriented emotion or it's indirectly because it's alerting you, it's turning your attention to a threat, which is a threat to a value. Once you translate that all into values, what you're doing is you're saying, oh, there's this value and this value and this value and this value and this value. And you now are contemplating values. You're now probably going to be in a state mostly of serenity because what you're going to feel, I mean, when you contemplate a value, what you feel is love for it. That is what you feel. So now I'm not sure exactly how this connects to what you were asking, Amy, but if you want to feel more love, do the three good things exercise. You know, the three good things exercise. Uh, please uh, elaborate. <laughs> it's every, I got this from Martin Seligman every day, write down three good things that happened yesterday. Now there's some variations on this, but the basic thing, if you just do that, you mm -hmm. are contemplating values when you do that. Now, if you really want to do it, take another step and go a little deeper and say, what is the deep value that gives meaning to this? Mm -hmm. If you want to go even deeper, you can do Lynn Zinzer. You know, Lynn Zinzer is a coach mm -hmm. for the Thinking Lab. She does one-on-one -on -one coaching for people who want it. She's terrific. And uh, she made a variation on this. Instead of just three good things, it's three good things I did. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So three good things that I did. And then what you get is you get pride in all of these yeah. three good things. In yep. addition to joy, and this is some, and you know, it takes, it takes five minutes. You do it each day. This, this is one of the emotional resilience tools that people use in the launch program. It's the fun. If they don't know which one to use, I tell them do three good things. Yeah. Yeah. Just I mean, do I'll, this I'll, every day. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I bring that up, it was that, um, you know, so my, my mom actually passed away about 12 years ago and it's uh, taken some time and some doing lots of work to kind of integrate that and to um, sort through my feelings. And um, so when you talked about kind of separating between uh, the kind of contemplative feelings of uh, sadness and resignation and, um, uh, and that, that the action impulses. So the action about the, the feeling like I want to actually do something about, you know, her, her leaving um, boy, did I ever have a pickle with that one? <laughs> so, um, well, so. so, so, so there, the thing is, so what's really helpful there, Amy, mm -hmm. tell me one of the wishes you had of something you wished you could do. Well, I, I had a complex, um, relationship with my mom and she didn't really, she wasn't terribly rational. Uh, she didn't really take care of herself. Well, I'll just say that. And um, so there were there were many times in her life where I basically had to intervene and help her stay alive. Um, so long story, but uh, so so you know when she passed away, you know that was the feeling of like I have to intervene now, I have to keep her going, I have to get her to the hospital, so on and so forth. So it was it was it was quite a quite an interesting. It, you know, trying to reintegrate all of that. <laughs> um, right. So, but, would, would you, right. So, but let's look at this. So part of this, like when you feel, felt that pull, right. Yeah. Um, so let me, if you don't mind, is it all right if I, yeah. is it all right Absolutely. If I ask, now, are you saying that after she passed, you still felt like you needed to be doing that? Yeah. Oh right. yeah. So then the thing that I, because, because you had done it, it was actually part of your relationship. So I'm just gonna, you know, go out on a limb. Let's let's just say, so this is something, obviously it's not about taking her to the hospital because she's not around, mm -hmm. but you can always go a little deeper with that and say, what does that symbolize for you? What is taking her to the hospital symbolize for you? Saving my value, this extremely top value that I had in my life. Right, so this is, so, so, you're having done that with symbolic of your dedication to your values, of your integrity, of knowing that even though she was mixed up and she had her problems, you cared about her and you were going to fight for her. Mm -hmm. So in your, so your mother symbolizes for you, your integrity and your willingness to fight for your values. And now there's kind of a hole in your life, partly because you used to have that campaign you were on. Yeah. And you probably need something else in your life that is of comparable importance that you can fight for, because yeah. that's a big part of you. Fighting for your values is a big part of you. That's the way that I would reinterpret something like that. It's you when you have that emotional pull, 
it seems like it's about the concrete. What you want to do is you want to go more abstract and more deep. What does it really mean to you? Because there's always some other way. I bet you have some other thing that you think is really important that you want to fight for or that you are fighting for oh, yeah. now. Oh, sure. Right. Oh, absolutely. And you see, when you see that, <laughs> when, you, when you see that, gee, my fighting for my mother informed what I'm doing now. Yes. You actually have the experience of, hey, this is, my mother is still with me because her legacy is here in this part of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the way that people stay in your life. And that when grieving them, they really become, they stay as a part of your life. I mean, I have social relationships that have been informed by having my, my because my mother died, because mm -hmm. I appreciated the way she handled social relationships much more after she died than before she died. And it's mm -hmm. changed the way I deal with certain people. And so she's like with me and it's, it's something I learned from that. It's a little different from your story, but it's, but this is part of what grieving is about. You, yes. you know, when, when the person is there in your life, it's hard to be really explicit about every aspect that you value about them. And then they're gone and there's this big hole. And part of dealing with all those feelings is you're actually getting clear on every aspect of value in that mm -hmm. relationship and owning that and bringing it into your life now in it's going to be in a new incarnation but yes. you want to maintain that value people who don't grieve wind up getting a little hole in their lives because right. they don't they don't they don't they don't find ways in life to still get those deep values you're spot on and um it's only been only been since recently in the last couple of years that I've been able to look at my mom as kind of her own individual adult, her own individual woman, and the um, her her character, her virtues, her fighting spirit, um, that I can say that these are the things that I loved about her and I valued about her. And um, uh, those are part of me now. Yeah, so right. That's, exactly. that's, that's the way to, you're absolutely right in terms of right. keeping a loved one with you after they're gone. Right, great. Yeah. Good. Congratulations on that, Amy. That's thank you. That takes a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. But I should it's say that your, your 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 distinctions between those kinds of emotions really helped um, put you know a couple more puzzle puzzle pieces into the puzzle for me. So thank you. I'm I'm delighted <laughs> to hear that. Real quick, we've got a couple more super chats. Alejandro, thank you for those three euro and Apollo Zeus, and he says. Uh, I wish Harry and Jean were my parents. Well, you know, Apollo Zeus, you could you could have Jean be your your coach at least part time. All you got to do is join the Thinking Labs, and you'll have access to Jean and Lynn, and they can be your here. parents. Well, here, here, <laughs> maybe not your parents, but <laughs> no, that, that that might be a stretch. But you don't need parents. You've got enough parents. You no, know, what you need are the resources available, Thinking Directions, outstanding, Jean. Obviously, we could go on. We've gone now much more than an hour, and I have oh, more we have. questions yeah. to ask. But I would love to do this again. You have sure. you with your work with Harry online, and then recently with with Lee as well. You you become prolific ARC UK, and uh, always great insights. Mm -hmm. Listeners, if you if you haven't already gone to the website, you need to sign up for that uh, Thinking Direction Starter Kit, and. Uh, Right away, three MP3s, multiply the power of thought, emotions and values 101. If you want additional clarification on the emotions and values discussion today, emotions and values 101, as well as how to focus your thoughts for action. Mm -hmm. That PDF, how many of us think, well, I could do so much more if I could just stay focused on what I really want. Those resources are there. Gene, you, you make so much of this available for free. You. You've got an outstanding paid subscription program. And uh, I, I, did, I, I look at your stuff and I think, man, it's got to feel really good to be Gene, not just to be so effective <laughs> at what you do, but to have so much impact on people and you know, not just people at large, but people you can respect and help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. It's it's. Uh... I do have a calling and this is it. And it's, and I'm very grateful. This it's been great to be on the show. Wonderful to have, I mean, you guys get it and you take what I give you and you make it your own. And that's what I'm in this for. That is what I, that is why I'm doing it. So that is, that thank is you so very good, much. So good to hear. There are Amazing a few people you resources. meet and you think, yes, I bet that person thinks 
I have the best job in the world. And I bet you're one of those <laughs> people because you yes, are I doing do. some of the best stuff. <laughs> And you're doing some yeah, of it just by great. talking to us today. So again, everybody get out there, take advantage of those resources, get as much out of the hundreds of outstanding articles and essays. And then once you're ready, sign up, subscribe, become part of Thinking Labs as well. Gene, thank you so much. Let's do this again soon. Thank you, Gene. You bet. Thank you so Thanks, much. Robert. Thanks, Amy. Really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Have an outstanding day. Use this stuff and we'll talk to you next week.